Space W5. Millions fly the friendly skies. Canada is a leader in aviation in so many areas. Putting their trust in the airlines. I can assure you that safety is uppermost on our minds. But is your pilot up for the job? So it's like he's drunk. Some aspects of performance, yeah. Kevin Newman investigates a shocking aerial threat. Any kind of foggy confusion can have catastrophic results. The exhausted crews. You would think going into a flight that your pilot is rested and ready. And the near misses. Air Canada flew directly over us. But will authorities take action? Why are the U.S. rules different than Canadian rules? Before disaster strikes. Should I be scared the next time I fly? And hailed as a medical breakthrough. In virtually every hernia repair that I do, I would use mesh. A supposedly easy fix. Would you have mesh? I would have mesh, yeah. But how safe is it? The pain got worse and worse and worse. Avis Favreau examines the prolific use of medical mesh. What was your life like? Before, my life was great. The unforeseen side effects. I've been to the hospital twice. And the rising call for change. We need to find something better. The doctors who won't work without it. It's the best method that we have. And the patients who can't live with it. My life was taken away from me and my kids. Here is Kevin Newman. Hello, and thanks for joining us. If you're on shift work, you know how disruptive those schedules can be, particularly on your health and alertness. Well, now imagine having responsibility for hundreds of lives feeling that way. Canadian pilots operate under some of the oldest regulations in the world regarding fatigue. And as our investigation reveals, they're often sleeping on the job, sometimes accidentally, while you're in the air. It's 10 p.m. in Toronto, and Canadian pilot Captain Raddick is walking into the cockpit of a passenger jet carrying almost 200 people. He's about to fly five and a half hours to San Francisco. When he arrives, his internal clock tells him it's three in the morning, and he's been awake for 19 hours. Because even though he tried to nap before his flight, jet lag prevented him from sleeping. I think that the shifts are so irregular. Shifting from day to night and back to day. Um, Across time zones and different continents. I think it's as hard as it gets. The 20-year veteran will fly back to Toronto tomorrow night, his ninth day in a row, over which he's flown to eight cities spread over five time zones. Captain Raddick is not his real name. We're hiding his identity because he thinks he'd be fired for admitting something passengers might be shocked to learn. Have you ever fallen asleep, full on asleep in a cockpit? Yes. Have you ever seen your co-pilot fall asleep in a cockpit? Yes. Have you ever woken up from that and thought, I just put hundreds of people's lives in jeopardy? I think we don't let ourselves think that reality. Maybe we should be thinking in those terms. Should I be scared the next time I fly? I think you should be wondering what the schedule of the pilot's been like for the past seven days. Is there any way a passenger can figure that out? No. At first, it felt like we had hit a mountain. Louisa Pickering learned the hard way that Canadian pilots sleep in the cockpit. She lives here in San Francisco. But in January of 2011, she was on an Air Canada flight from Toronto to Zurich. Several hours in and over the Atlantic, most of the passengers were asleep. I just recently got up to go brush my teeth, came back, sat in my empty row, was gonna try and get some sleep before I landed in Zurich. And then what happened? Then all of a sudden I flew out of my chair. Really? My entire body came off the seat and hit the overhead compartment. We've recreated what happened. The first officer had been sleeping in the cockpit for an hour and 15 minutes. That's way over the maximum 40 minutes allowed by Air Canada rules. He woke up when he heard the captain check in with the control tower in Scotland. The captain told the first officer that an American military cargo jet was approaching from below. Well, groggy and confused, the first officer thought the planet Venus was the oncoming plane. 
The captain corrected him. He said, no, the plane is 1,000 feet below us. But still disoriented, the first officer then thought the oncoming aircraft was on an imminent collision course. And so he put the plane into a 400-foot dive toward the path of the oncoming plane. The captain took over and quickly brought the jet under control, and the transport plane passed just beneath them. 16 people, including two crew members, were injured by the sudden dive. Louisa recorded the aftermath with her phone. Everyone is safe, but this is part of the damage. My phone went flying, I went flying, I hit my head. Officially, our Canada said it was turbulence. Uh, when did you find out it wasn't just that? I found out a year later after doing an interview with a small paper in Canada that it was actually um, pilot fatigue and that we almost collided with another aircraft. Canadian investigators concluded that fatigue was the main cause of the mishap and noted a third pilot isn't required on transatlantic flights. If you had flown an American aircraft across the Atlantic, they would have been required to have a third pilot on board. Canadian regulations don't require that. You can just have two pilots. Do you think that's safe? I do not at all think that's safe, considering what I'd, what I'd gone through in 2011. Um, finding out that our pilot had been sleeping for like 70 minutes um, is very disturbing. So in Canada, they have these things called controlled rests, where the pilot or the co-pilot can take a, a nap and go to sleep on the flight deck. Did you know that existed? I did not know that existed until afterwards. Did you assume that Canadian pilots are allowed to sleep on long distance flights? I would never assume that, no. I mean, Why not? I, I just, doesn't sound safe, I guess. <laughs> Canadian pilots fall asleep in the cockpit a lot more than you may think. W5 has obtained this unreleased survey of 1,900 Canadian pilots submitted to the Canadian government last fall. And a majority, 56%, reported that they had fallen asleep sometime during their last two trips. Some of them took a nap on purpose, but one in five admitted that they had fallen asleep accidentally. Pilots are tired. We need a new rule. We needed a rule 10 years ago. Captain Dan Adamus heads the Canadian wing of the Airline Pilots Association International that represents more than 2,500 pilots. Canada is a leader in aviation in so many areas. We're looked upon for advice from many other countries in this world. Why we are lagging in flight and duty times, I don't know. Adamus co-chaired an advisory council that recommended fatigue rule changes for the federal government. And now, after seven years of listening to pilots, airlines, and a slew of experts, Transport Canada has published its plan to update the old fatigue rules. The proposals include reducing annual flight time limits from 1,200 to 1,000 hours, increasing the length of rest periods from 8 to 10 hours, and limiting daily flight time from 14 hours to between 9 and 13 hours, depending on when a pilot starts their day. But Adamus says, in spite of all the consultation, the new rules still fall below international standards. It allows pilots to fly longer, especially in the backside of the clock, which is the wee hours of the morning, longer than what it should be. And that, compared to other countries, that's what puts Canada, out of the 191 member states, puts Canada right at the bottom and currently, there's only two countries that have more lax rules than us. What are those countries? Bangladesh and uh, India. Under the proposed rules, Canadian pilots would be allowed to fly longer than their American counterparts in almost every nightside time slot. The US has some of the toughest fatigue rules, but it took a tragedy to get there. COVID 3407, Canada Tower 120.5. Have a good night. February 12, 2009, Colgan Air Flight 3407 left Newark for Buffalo. Both pilots were tired. The first officer had just commuted nearly 4,000 kilometers from Seattle. Colgan 3407, approach. On final approach, the plane was flying dangerously slow, which triggered a warning system that signals an impending stall. Then, a series of mistakes. Instead of pushing the nose down and accelerating, the pilot pulled up. The first officer retracted the flaps without being asked, 
causing it to lose lift. It pitched, rolled, and crashed. Cobra 3407, Buffalo Tower, how do you hear? Cobra 3407, Buffalo. The aircraft hit a house, killing all 49 on board and one on the ground. U.S. federal investigators concluded that among other human errors, the pilot's performance was likely impaired because of fatigue. The crash prompted the International Civil Aviation Organization, ICAO, to create new standards to manage safety and fatigue. The U.S. and several other countries quickly followed suit. And look what happened. Between 1990 and 2010, the United States had 1,100 passenger airline deaths. Since the new regulations were introduced, there have been zero. How do we stack up against American pilots? Currently, we are way behind. Way, way behind. The new rule going forward, if it's allowed to stand where it is today, bumps us up slightly, but we're still in the bottom half. Ultimately, pilots themselves decide if they're too fatigued to fly. They're expected to show up fit for duty, and it's their job to self-assess whether they're too tired. Is that a reliable way no. of determining whether or not you're tired? No. Clinton Marquardt is a fatigue specialist in Ottawa, and he's worked with the Transportation Safety Board to help investigate yeah. dozens of aviation accidents and mishaps. In the middle range of fatigue, uh, where people start to begin to become fatigued is where you start to see performance decrements. But it's also the spot uh, along the spectrum where it's the hardest to gauge your fatigue levels. So if you're simply asking a pilot, how do you feel and are you good to go? Chances are they'll say, I'm doing well and yeah, I'm good to go. I'm, I can fly, no problem. When the exact opposite is true. If the regulations rely on self-reporting and the self-reporting is unreliable, generally, how safe is that? If you're relying on an unsafe measure to gauge whether or not people are fatigued, it doesn't improve safety at all. At all. How does the performance of a fatigued pilot differ from a rested pilot? Their reaction time slows down. So it takes them longer to process information and then do some sort of behavior in response to that information. They also have a lot harder time paying attention. So in the fatigue world, we call this vigilance. Their ability to maintain vigilance becomes impaired. You also see changes in the ability to make uh, decisions um, safely. They tend to make riskier decisions. We gave Marquardt an actual pilot's schedule and sleep patterns over a two week period. So he could create a computer analysis of the fatigue levels. So what are we seeing here? So this is the pilot's sleep-wake schedule and duty schedule that, uh, that we looked at. Blue line is when the pilot was uh, asleep according to his own record. The dark black lines are flight times. So this is probably the riskiest flight here, and I believe he was flying from Toronto to Europe. You can see at the tail end of flight, right here, at about uh, quarter after five in the morning, his effectiveness or his performance was at 68%. So he's at his most fatigued at the landing of the aircraft. At the landing of the aircraft. Right. Which is a pretty delicate point in a flight delicate and especially if you compare that to blood alcohol concentration performance levels. If you look over on this line here, you can see that at 0 0.08, he's below that. So it's like he's drunk. Some aspects of performance, yeah. Would a pilot say something to another pilot if they thought they'd been drinking? Absolutely. But not that they might be too tired to fly? Not once in my 20 years of flying has anyone said, hey, are you tired today? New regulations bring new concerns. That's going to increase costs. But what's the real price of safety? Our passengers deserve a lot better. When W5 continues. Canada has some of the world's weakest rules when it comes to managing pilot fatigue. And more than half of pilots surveyed admit they've fallen asleep in the cockpit during their last two flights. Now, years after many other countries took steps to ensure pilots are better rested, the federal government is ready to update those rules, increasing rest periods and limiting daily flight times. But pilots say the proposals still lag behind the United States and many other countries. This pilot, whose identity we're protecting, says it certainly happened to him and not long ago. So when was the last time you fell asleep flying a plane? 
uh, last week. Have you ever run across somebody who didn't sleep while the aircraft was in the air? No. There's sleep happening all the time. Yes. And how much of that do you think is involuntary? I would say more than half. Pilots tell us that flying a big passenger jet can be monotonous, even hypnotizing, especially at night. You can fly for hours with not a lot to do except monitor controls in a quiet, dark, and cramped cockpit. But it's at this moment of landing when things get a lot busier, and any kind of foggy confusion can have catastrophic results. Well, confusion was definitely a factor here in San Francisco in July of 2017 when an Air Canada jet came within meters of potentially causing the worst loss of human life in aviation history. Uh, good evening, Air Canada 759 with you. Uh, have my visual to right. July 7th, 2017, just before midnight, and Air Canada Flight 759 from Toronto carrying 140 people is cleared to land at San Francisco Airport. Now, runways are lit with white lights, and taxiways have blue lights with a green center. But instead of lining up for the runway, the pilots lined up for a parallel taxiway, where four other aircraft sat, full of fuel and hundreds of passengers. What you're about to hear is the control tower recording. Uh, tower, just want to confirm, uh, camera 759, uh, we see some lights on the uh, runway there, across the runway, can you control the land? The Air Canada pilot tells air traffic control that he sees something on the runway. Air Canada 759, confirm, clear to land runway 2A right. There is no one on 2A right, but you. Control insists the runway is clear, and the Air Canada plane continues right at the idling planes. He's on the taxiway. Where's this guy going? Then, just above the first plane, and just 18 meters from the ground, it abruptly pulls up. 1 Air Canada flew directly over us. Yeah, I saw that guy. The plane circled around and landed safely. In post-incident interviews, the Canadian pilots said they did not recall seeing planes on the taxiway, but admitted that something did not look right to them. Despite how close it came to disaster, no one reported the near miss for two days. In that time, the Air Canada cockpit flight recorder was recorded over, erasing any record of what the pilots were saying to each other. The near catastrophe prompted the US Federal Aviation Administration to issue this safety alert, urging airlines to emphasize the need for crew rest and encourage communication between crew members relative to rest. Investigators are still examining what role fatigue may have played in what happened. There is no fatigue problem in Canada. John McKenna heads the Air Transport Association of Canada, which represents dozens of airlines. He says Canadian pilots might be tired, but there's no hard evidence that fatigue causes crashes. It's never been identified as a contributing factor in any commercial aviation accident or incident in recent, in, in, in as long as I can remember. McKenna says Canadian Airlines are already world leaders when it comes to managing fatigue issues. And the new rules will only drive up passenger and cargo costs because smaller airlines can't afford to hire more pilots. When you have to hire 30% more pilots to offer the same level of service, that's going to increase costs. Uh, we have 25 aircraft. AJ yeah, Vermani yeah, says his airline is an example of a business that will take an unfair hit that will cost Canadians more money. He runs Canada's biggest cargo airline, Cargo Jet, based just outside of Hamilton. He wants cargo airlines exempt from the new rules. So why shouldn't the same fatigue rules apply to cargo pilots uh, as they do for passengers? I don't know of one cargo accident in North America because of fatigue. But do you have to wait for an accident to bring in those rules? Well, this is what I say, that the government believes that pilot is a pilot, fatigue is fatigue, and plane is a plane. They don't recognize the fact that pilots in cargo business, most of them are flying at night. You start your work at night. Your body gets used to working at night. So if the new regulations state that you have to abide by what Transport Canada is proposing, mm -hmm. what's that going to do to CargoJet? 
we'll have to hire uh, an additional one-third workforce, maybe half more, maybe another 50 to 100 pilots, which is an expense of 10 to $20 million a year. The general consumer will end up absorbing these rates at some point. Vermani points out that this is one regulation where Canada would be tougher than the United States. Because in the U.S., cargo airlines are exempt from the fatigue rules. Why are the U.S. rules different than Canadian rules? The simple answer, money. The U.S. government estimated that complying with its new rules would cost cargo airlines more than $300 million and thousands of jobs. But the cost of a cargo jet crash and the deaths of its small crew was almost one-tenth that. W5 asked the federal transport minister for a sit-down interview to discuss the proposed rules in Canada. Mark Garneau's office refused, so we stopped him on the way into question period. Minister Garneau, it's Kevin Newman from W5. I was wondering if I could ask you a couple of questions about the uh, new fatigue regulations uh, that you're proposing to bring in. A lot of pilots are saying that they're not as tough as even the American standards. Are you putting pilots in jeopardy by not adopting the most stringent standards? I can assure you that uh, safety is uppermost in our, on our minds and we've done a great deal of consultation. We'll make sure that these rules are going to ensure the safety of passenger. Minister are, uh, Minister, are there any circumstances where a Canadian pilot crew should be flying farther than uh, their equivalent American pilot crew, no matter what the new regulations say? We have say? done a great deal of research on what's done by the FAA, but what's done by other airlines uh, or organizations uh, in the world that are responsible for flight duty days and fatigue. We feel that we've come up with a program uh, of flight duty days under various circumstances that addresses the situation. I invite comments from pilots. Our regulations are, are not where they should be. Our passengers deserve a lot better. Um, my family deserves a lot better. Captain Reddick isn't convinced Transport Canada wants to listen to pilots. He is convinced that not listening to pilots is dangerous. I think it's probably the number one threat to aviation right now. That scares me a bit, should it? I think we should all start to have more concern about that. There's no timeline on when the government will proceed with the new fatigue rules or perhaps change them. Here's what's straight ahead. This is not right. Their health ruined. I feel useless. Their voices unheard. Nobody will listen to them. When W5 continues,